the third Sunday of 2022. It's already the third Sunday. And it's also the third and final week of our series, When God's People Pray. And we just wanted to welcome you to this online service and just to kick it off with some worship. And before we do, we'd love to just read a verse that inspired the song choice, which is in Romans 8 verse 33, if you want to grab your Bibles. And it goes like this. Who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? It is God who justifies. Who then is the one who condemns? No one. Christ Jesus, who died more than that, who was also raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. And with that, will you join us in worship, singing Alive in Us? (laughs) 
preach on the verse, pray without ceasing. Pray without ceasing. The verse is found in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, and it's verse 17. Here are the verses. First from the New American Standard Bible, and then from the NIV. Paul writes, Pray without ceasing. In everything give thanks, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. And the NIV puts it this way, pray continually. What does it mean to pray continually? To pray without ceasing. Not five times a day as the Muslims do, or twice a day as devout Jews often do. Not even along the biblical pattern of Daniel, who prayed three times a day, or perhaps like King David, who hinted in Psalm 119 that he prayed seven times a day. We as Christians are instructed to pray all of the time, to start praying and to never stop, to pray without ceasing. How should we understand this verse? What kind of prayer is this? We don't live in a monastery. We're not cloistered. There's stuff to do. We have lives to live, responsibilities to fulfill. So how can we spend every waking moment in prayer? I think perhaps this verse is teaching us to think about prayer in a different way. To think of prayer simply as being communion with God. And surely that is what prayer is. Prayer is enjoying fellowship with God, is a two-way conversation with God. It's not just us bringing our list of requests to God. Prayer is so much more than that. It's fundamentally about living in union with Christ Jesus, enjoying fellowship with the Holy Spirit and with the Father all of the time. It's about living in God's presence and involving God in every aspect of our lives. Possibly when you think about what prayer is, you think about Matthew chapter 6, what Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount when he described prayer in this way. He said, when you pray, go into your room, close the door and pray to your Father who is unseen. Of course, this is a very important form of prayer, shutting yourself away in a quiet place to spend time in fellowship with God. But if we're to pray without stopping, without ceasing, then a different kind of prayer must be practiced. I think typically when we think about what prayer is, we think about people using words to communicate with God, using words. But Jesus teaches us that words can be overrated when it comes to prayer. I'm sure you're familiar with what Jesus taught in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 6, verse 7 onwards. Jesus says, do not use meaningless repetition as the Gentiles do, for they suppose that they will be heard for their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask Him. So maybe words aren't quite as important or even as essential as we might think when it comes to prayer. So for the rest of the sermon, I want to share with you some examples from the Bible of people who prayed in unusual ways. Examples that I believe will help us to understand what it means to pray continuously. To start to pray and to never stop. 
I'm sure you can all relate to the first example I'm going to share. It's really when we're praying while we're doing something else. It's prayer on the go, multitasking prayer. I've called it in this sermon, stealth prayer, stealth prayer. And there's a classic example of stealth prayer from the second chapter of the book of Nehemiah. Nehemiah was the wine taster to King Artaxerxes. And uh, the conversation is described for us in Nehemiah 2. He says, I took the wine and gave it to the king. I'd not been in his presence before. So the king asked me, why does your face look so sad when you are not ill? This can be nothing but sadness of heart. I was very much afraid, but I said to the king, May the king live forever. Why should my face not look sad when the city where my fathers are buried lies in ruins and its gates have been destroyed by fire? The king said to me, What is it you want? Then I prayed to the God of heaven, and I answered the king. If it pleases the king, and if your servant has found favor in his sight, let him send me to the city in Judah, where my fathers are buried, so that I may rebuild it. Don't you love this? We're told after being asked a question that he prayed and he answered the king. How long must that prayer have been? A fraction of a second? This is prayer on the go. This is someone in a, a high-pressured work situation. You're, you're the cupbearer to the king, and he, he notices that, you, that you're looking down, and, and so he, he asks you, how are you? And this is your opportunity to, to speak up for God's kingdom. And so Nehemiah prays, and he answers the king. It's what I call stealth prayer. Most of us are probably experts in this kind of prayer. It's, it's the kind of prayer we can engage in all the time. You, you're driving your car and someone pulls in front of you and immediately a prayer goes up to heaven. Perhaps you're in a crisis at work or wherever and a, a prayer goes up to heaven while you're with other people or doing something else. This is one of the ways in which we're able to pray without ceasing. It's praying while we're doing other things. Nehemiah's at work, he's talking to the king and we're told, and he prayed, and he prayed. There's another funny form of prayer that I want to mention, and that is when we show things to God. It's when we show things to God. Can you imagine that? It's amazing how well one can communicate with someone you know very well by just a look or by pointing out something. They say that a picture paints a thousand words. Well, sometimes just pointing something out to someone can communicate a great deal. Husbands and wives do this all the time to the point where you may know what the other's thinking by the look in their eye. Sometimes it's possible to communicate with God in this same way. We can just show something to God. And before some of you think I've gone crazy, let me show you an example from the Bible where someone does just this. And our example comes from Isaiah chapter 37. And it's after Hezekiah receives a, a letter from Sennacherib. And in Isaiah 37, we read this, Sennacherib received a report 
The report was that the king of Egypt was marching out to fight against him. And when he heard it, he sent messages to Hezekiah with this word. And this is the letter, the message. Say to Hezekiah, king of Judah, do not let the God you depend on deceive you when he says Jerusalem will not be handed over to the king of Assyria. Surely you've heard what the kings of Assyria have done to all the countries, destroying them completely. So Hezekiah receives this rather troubling letter. And take a look at what he does in verse 14. Hezekiah received the letter from the messengers and read it. Then he went up to the temple of the Lord and spread it out before the Lord. Can you imagine this? As part of his prayer, he literally unrolls the letter and places it down on the ground open so that he can show it to God. Sometimes we spend a great deal of time in prayer explaining things to God. Things that, of course, he's fully aware of already. And so when it comes to this letter that Hezekiah receives, he doesn't bother to explain to God what's in the letter. He just unrolls it and shows it to the Lord. In fact, I don't know why he even bothered to unroll the letter because God knew what was in the letter and God knew what was in the letter before Sennacherib even wrote it. But part of Hezekiah's prayer was in words, but a great deal of it was simply showing God this letter that he had received. I wonder if you've ever shown documents to God as part of your prayer life. I have. Perhaps you get a medical report that is disturbing. Well, you can lay it out and show it to God. That is a form of prayer. Perhaps you get a letter that that hurts you. You can show that to God. Perhaps you get a bill that you can't pay. Why don't you show that letter to the Lord? Let's stop thinking that the best way to communicate with God is with words. Because often there are more effective ways to communicate with Him. And if we're going to learn to pray without ceasing, we're going to have to learn how to pray in more creative ways. I want to speak a little bit now about other ways in which we can pray without words. We often think of prayer as primarily being about speaking to God. But I don't think God analyzes the words that we say. I don't think God's interested in in our grammar and our adjectives. I think God looks at our hearts, our intention, what we're trying to say, even if it comes out wrong. What if our words themselves actually mean very little to God and that he's hearing something else? He's hearing our hearts, our motivation, our trust, our faith, our earnestness. Because I think that is how prayer works. God is not English. Silence, too, is important when it comes to to praying. It's like the notes in a melody. You don't improve a melody by packing in more notes. If it wasn't for the silences, it would be noise, not a melody. I'm sure you've often come across that little Hebrew word in the Psalms, sila, sila. It crops up many times. It is probably a musical term, and it means to pause. It means stop and think about what you've just said to God, what you've just sung. Stop, pause, meditate. Meditate. 
because silence is also an important part of our communication with God. Do you remember what happened when the seventh scroll is opened in the book of Revelation? Revelation chapter 8 and verse 1. We read of the goings on in heaven, and when it comes to this climactic moment of Jesus opening the seventh scroll, we read that there was silence in heaven for half an hour. Silence in heaven for half an hour. It wasn't taking a break, an intermission. This was an act of silence, an intense silence, a way of showing God respect. That silence and our silences can be a profound act of worship. There's also that familiar verse, Psalm 46, verse 10, that says, Be still and know that I am God. Be still. Sometimes just being silent before God can be a form of prayer. Again, I'm taken to the words of Jesus, Matthew 6, verse 7. Don't pray with meaningless repetition like those who don't know God. They suppose they will be heard for their many words, but that's not how prayer works. As I was preparing this, I also thought of that, that song that Matt Redman wrote, Let My Words Be Few. And that's a song based on Ecclesiastes 5. Here, here is that instruction. Guard your steps when you go to the house of God. Do not be quick with your mouth. Don't be hasty in your heart to utter anything before God. God is in heaven and you are on earth, so let your words be few. Much dreaming and many words are meaningless. Rather, stand in awe of God. Just as we communicate with each other with body language and actions, so we can communicate with God in, in this way. Remember the two men that went up to the temple to pray that Jesus speaks about in, in Luke 18. The one went and stood up and we're told prayed about himself. God, I thank you I'm not like other men, robbers, evildoers, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week and give a tenth of all I get. That was the one person's prayer. Listen to how the tax collector prays. He would not even look up to heaven, but beat his breast. He beat his breast and said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. And Jesus says, I tell you that this man, rather than the other, went home justified. Beating his breast and bowing his head in humility was a far more meaningful way of communicating with God than the so-called good man's many fine words. Prayer is not just about words. It's about posture, gestures. Our whole demeanor can be a form of prayer. In Scripture, we're commanded to raise our hands in prayer. Why raise our hands in prayer? What's, what's that all about? Well, it's an act of worship. It's an act of surrender. It expresses our openness and dependence and willingness to receive from God. We're instructed to raise our hands in prayer because that in itself is part of our prayer. Kneeling, lying prostrate, these actions can speak louder than words. 
Here's another unusual form of prayer. Perhaps the most unusual form of prayer I'll share about today. And that it relates to groaning, sighing, and crying. Groaning, sighing, and crying. Remember I said earlier how I don't believe that the Lord analyzes our language when we pray. Our words aren't nearly as important as we might think. Do you know how the Holy Spirit prays for us? Listen to what it says in Romans 8. Romans 8 from verse 26. The Spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not know what we ought to pray for. But the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groans that words cannot express. So here we're being told that the Holy Spirit doesn't just help us to pray, but he also prays for us. And he intercedes for us with groans that words cannot express. Because sometimes a groan can convey much more than a sentence. Are you familiar with this description of Jesus' prayer life that we find in Hebrews 5? We're told that during the days of Jesus' life on earth, he offered up prayers and petitions with loud cries and tears to the one who could save him. What a fascinating description of Jesus' prayer life. He didn't sit quietly in his room. We're told that there were times when he offered up prayers and petitions with loud cries and shouts and groans and tears. And then there's Paul in Galatians 4 describing how he prayed at times as being like a woman in labor. That's how he, he struggled and labored in prayer for people. I'm sure there were groans. He says in Galatians, For my dear children, for whom I am again in the pains of childbirth until Christ is formed in you. That's travailing in prayer. His burden was so intense, it seemed to him like he was in labor. Have you ever groaned in prayer? God can understand a groan. Tears, too, can be a form of prayer. Here I, I think of Hannah in 1 Samuel chapter 1. Her prayer is so unconventional that she's asked by the man in charge to please leave the temple for being a public disturbance. What kind of prayer must it be that, that gets you disinvited from the temple? Hannah's heartfelt prayer is brought on by her deep desire to, to have a child. Here's her story in 1 Samuel chapter 1. Elkanah had two wives. One was called Hannah and the other Penina. Penina had children, but Hannah had none. Year after year, this man went up from his town to worship and sacrifice to the Lord Almighty at Shiloh. Elkanah, her husband, would say to her, Hannah, why are you weeping? Why don't you eat? Why are you downhearted? Don't I mean more to you than ten sons? And this is Hannah's prayer. In bitterness of soul, Hannah wept much and prayed to the Lord. 
As she kept on praying to the Lord, Eli observed her mouth. Hannah was praying in her heart, and her lips were moving, but her voice was not heard. Eli thought she was drunk and said to her, How long will you keep on getting drunk? Get rid of your wine. Not so, my Lord, Hannah replied. I am a woman who is deeply troubled. I've not been drinking wine or beer. I was pouring out my soul to the Lord. Do not take your servant for a wicked woman. I have been praying here out of my great anguish and grief. I love Hannah's description of what prayer is. In verse 15, she says, I was pouring out my soul to the Lord. Yes, I'm sure she was crying at times. That's a very meaningful prayer. Psalm 56 verse 8 tells us that the Lord keeps a record of our tears. The ESV says, you've kept a count of my tossings. You've put my tears in your bottle. Crying is a meaningful form of prayer, something that God takes notice of. I think all these kinds of Prayer, help us to pray continually. And then the last kind of prayer I want to mention is the gift of tongues, praying in tongues. Let's read what Paul says about this unusual spiritual gift. 1 Corinthians chapter 14, Paul says, I thank God that I speak in tongues more than all of you. But in church, I would rather speak five intelligible words to instruct others than 10,000 words in a tongue. So Paul is telling us here that he spoke in tongues a great deal. He says, really, there's, there's no one here that speaks in tongues more than I do. But he was not doing it in church. He was doing it when he was at home by himself or when he was by himself, wherever he was. It was a way that he prayed in 1 Corinthians 14 and verse 2, earlier in that chapter, he describes what speaking in tongues can be. Sometimes it can be prophetic, but here Paul is saying it is also a way of praying. In 1 Corinthians 14 verse 2, he says, The one who speaks in a tongue does not speak to men, but to God. If he's speaking to God, it is prayer. Indeed, no one understands him. He utters mysteries with his spirit. And also in this chapter, he makes reference to praying in a tongue. Here it is, verse 14 of chapter 14. If I pray in a tongue, my spirit prays, but my mind is unfruitful. So what shall I do? I will pray with my spirit, but will also pray with my mind. Praying in tongues is a, a way of communing with God that doesn't use the mind. This too can be a form of stealth prayer. It made me think about an, an app, for example, on a mobile phone that, that runs in the background. Some apps will say, can I have permission to run in the background? Check that box. Praying in tongues is something that you can do while you're doing other things because it, the mind is unfruitful. It is a spiritual communion and connection with God. In conclusion then, I hope that the sermon has encouraged you to have a broad view of what prayer is. Prayer can take many different forms. 
Prayer is not just sitting in a quiet place with your Bible and sharing your prayer list with God. Prayer takes many forms, and these are some of the forms of prayer that we have to learn if we're going to pray without ceasing, if we're going to live lives that are prayerful all of the time. The disciples once said to Jesus, teach us how to pray. It's interesting that they didn't ask for help with many things. But they did ask, Lord, teach us how to pray. And I think we do have to learn how to pray, to grow in these different expressions of prayer. Our verse for the sermon today, 1 Thessalonians 5, 17, Pray without ceasing. In everything, give thanks, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. This verse also points out that in everything, all of the time, we should be prayerful, conscious of our communion with God the Father. We've looked at the example of stealth praying, praying while you're doing something else, praying while you're at work, praying in a crisis. When the king said to Nehemiah, what is it you want? We read, I prayed to the God of heaven and I answered the king. Sometimes prayer can be as simple as showing something to God, pointing something out to God. In Isaiah 37, we see Hezekiah taking a letter and showing it to God. I'm not embarrassed to say that I've had good news come in letters and I've shown it to God. Silence can be a meaningful form of prayer. We're told to be still and to know that He is God. In Revelation, we read that after the opening of the seventh scroll, there was silence in heaven for half an hour. That's, that's an act of worship. It's an act of silence. And we can communicate with God with our posture, our gestures, our demeanor. We're to lift up holy hands in prayer. Perhaps we need to be at times like the man who prayed, who beat his chest. We saw how the Holy Spirit intercedes for us using groans that words cannot express. And we saw that verse from Hebrews 5 where Jesus regularly cried out to God and expressed tears before God. Paul described his prayer life at times as being like a woman in labor. And then there's praying in tongues, that spiritual activity of keeping communion with God, of pouring out one's spirit and one's heart before the Lord. I want to encourage you to learn how to pray continually, to pray without ceasing, to pray all of the time, to find ways and means of involving the Lord in all of your life, in every waking hour. Let us pray. Thank you, Lord, that we can pray that we can approach your throne of grace through the blood of Jesus and in the power of the Holy Spirit. And as we've read today, the apostles' instruction that we are to pray without ceasing. We pray for your grace to be able to do this, Lord. Teach us how to pray. Expand our understanding of what prayer is and take us deeper into the ways of prayer. For we want to know you, Lord. We want to walk with you and talk with you.
all of our days. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you.